Hello, everyone. This is Yu Sai. Welcome to Let's Talk. This week has been so special. I get to interview authors and writers all about food and Top Chef winner this season, Melissa King. And today is no different. When we are going to be talking about food again, and today my guest is Myling, who is a Top Chef winner of season twelve. But she's been very busy the last five years. We're going to learn all about her journeys, how she began and joined the Top Chef team, and what she's doing now. Thank you for joining me today, Meiling. Thanks for having me. Well, let everybody know where you're at presently. I'm、um, currently in Los Angeles,、uh, in my home.、Um, it's a bit of a mess.、Um, actually, trying to pack up my things because I'm moving into a house soon. So, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> during this time, not easy to move during this time. Yeah, it's it's going to be a while until I actually move in, but just kind of gathering, you know, a lot of my things and you know donating things to to Goodwill and、um, uh, other donation centers、uh, to people in need. So. And may I ask where you're moving to? Oh, just literally ten ten minutes down the street. <laughs> <laughs> so you, not not anywhere far. Yeah. So you would still be my neighbor. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you, thank you so much for joining me today. And I, I had such amazing time this week talking to different chefs and talking to your friend Melissa as well. And and it's been such a rewarding and educational week. Have a departure away from the fashion world, be able to dive into the food world, and learn so much about what top chefs have done for so many different contestants over the years. I would love to know a little bit about your journey before Top Chef. And after after Top Chef, because I feel like Top Chef is almost like a university. People go through it and they come out a total different person, a total different chef. So let's dive right into the early years. <laughs>、um, well, I actually I'm born in China,、um, and I came over to the States、um, when I was about three year or three months old.、Um, our family we had some extended family in. Uh, Dearborn, Michigan. So we decided to settle there, and、um, from there on out, you know, I、um, started working in the family restaurant for my aunts,、um, for my parents,、um, other family members, and so I grew up as a restaurant kid and、um, was always in, you know, the hustle and bustle of the restaurant world. So I always felt like this was something like. That I was gonna, you know, be a part of in the long run,、um, but but yeah, I, it's it's crazy to it's crazy to think that you know I, I've worked in the restaurant for so many years,、um, professionally not for as long, probably about、um, a little over twelve years or so,、um, but yeah, the journey's been been a crazy one, that's for、oh. sure. We have very similarities because I grew up in Midwest as well in Terre Haute,、yeah. Indiana, and worked in my uncle's kitchen with my dad. So I feel like we're <laughs> we're sharing the same same DNA <laughs> past. But、yeah. but I know for me during that time, I saw a hard. How hard they have to work in the food industry. It's early、yeah. morning rise, and it's the last person to leave. And and I promised myself I would never. Ever want to be in the kitchen as a career, and、yeah. and and that was because it was just hard. It was really hard. It wasn't that I didn't respect it, but it, and I was a kid and and I was young and and you know you'd rather be playing out in the grass instead of you know learning how to <laughs> chop and break down a chicken and a rabbit.、Yeah. <laughs> but that's what all culturally that's what Asian Americans do. And being first generation、mm-hmm. here, I'm sure you can relate that you、yeah. you're we're here for a pure survival. We're in a survival、yeah. mode. Absolutely. Um, and it's funny that you touch on、um, not ever wanting to be in the restaurant、um, because I think I like going into middle school, high school. Like I never wanted to work in the restaurant,、um, but obviously I, I had to for you know survival. Like as a as a as a teenager, you need money to to buy things. So、um, yeah, I just never wanted to be in the restaurant, and I never thought I would actually go back into this industry. Um, but I just I I had a realization that I this is something that I really enjoy doing and I have a, a lot of fun doing it and so I I pursued it. When was that pivotal point for you? Went from survival mode 
to I actually enjoy doing it because that 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 path is not easy to find for everyone. Yeah, well, more or less, um, I was during the teenage years. I helped my mom a lot in the front of the house, um, so a lot of serving, a lot of busing, things of that sort. And so that part I don't enjoy as much um, at that time. But yeah, I just I got into the kitchen, and I always. I always did like little, um, little side work, um, things like, you know, peeling potatoes or, you know, picking pea pods, filling up containers of, uh, you know, soy sauce or plum sauce, things like that. Um, doing more hands on things like that, I enjoyed a lot more. So I think that that was kind of where, you know, I started to have a lot of fun. What kind of kid were you? Were you the kind of kid that did oh. not want to go into the kitchen when the family wanted you there, that it became a chore? Or yeah. were you the type that says, oh, this is what we have to do? Because I definitely was a kid that, <laughs> oh, my God, I was not a good kid. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was I a was pretty bad kid. I was I a really was, bad kid. I every tooth and nail not having to be in the kitchen. Yeah, I mean, I signed up for every activity after school, signed up for every sport just so I didn't have to be um, at the restaurant, so... Oh, you might be yeah, like Kinder. <laughs> you, you're, you're my twin. <laughs> and when did you move from the Midwest to the uh, West Coast? Um, well, I moved to the West Coast. I actually settled in San Diego uh, when I was 23. Mm. Um, I lived in Chicago for a little bit after Michigan. Um, and then, you know, I moved to, to San Diego and then moved to um, Las Vegas and then to L.A. So been around, I've been but... to LA. I've been in LA for a, almost 10 years now. It'll be wow. 10 years in September. Yeah. And while you were in Michigan growing up as Asian American, what was that experience like for you? Did you find it? Um, did you find racism in the way that was portrayed on you? Was it hard for being a first generation growing up in the Midwest? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so our family settled in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, and it was actually predominantly uh, Middle Eastern. So um, Asian population was very slim to none. Um, in my high school, I remember uh, entering my freshman year, I was one of three Asian people in, in general. So, um, and we actually had a pretty large, um, our, our high school was really, really large. So um, having that difference um, was, was pretty, pretty intense. Um, but I grew up, I grew up in Dearborn for, for most of my life. So I think I, I kind of got used to it uh, being the minority. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I remember being picked on and, you know, for, for being Chinese. So I think it's just kind of, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's kind of weird to like think about, to think about it now. Um, especially when I moved out to the West coast too, and I was exposed to a lot more Asians. I, it was just, it was a little bit of a culture shock for me. Um, Cause I've just, I've never been around so many people who look like me before. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting. And I, I, I agree with you because when I was in Terry Hill, Indiana, same thing, you know, we were the only Asian people except for the immediate family members that we knew that was living there and and traveling to the west coast for the very first time um, my dad had put us in a car and drove for five days to california and and we got to go to disneyland that weekend mm -hmm. and we begged our family uh, begged we begged our dad just go back home and pack up everything because we're not leaving we don't <laughs> care we have to stay in the car live on the street we don't want to leave and and you're right it's it was so we didn't know what home or how important a feeling of home or uh, people are like you, because there wasn't anyone like us on television at that time. Right. There wasn't people that, that you can look up to and go, I'm aspire to be that in America. And the notion of America is, is a land of your dream. You can do whatever you want, but it's not as easy <laughs> uh, laid out for, yes. for people of diversity. People come here and uh, immigrants, right? They, they're just, taught to work really, really hard, keep your head down and don't cause any waves. And yes. I, I love when you said that, having to think back about any type of racism is interesting because for me, the same, because I never thought of them. I just thought that's normal, right? You're right. like, oh, that's just, I'm gonna go to school. There's gonna be a bully. 
and there was a guy who always stole my lunch, and there's going to be a guy waiting around the corner, and I better have an extra $2 for him, and so I can save $2 in another pocket. Yeah. And it became a norm, and I feel like, especially what's happening in our environment today, and being on this show, talking about it with other Asian Americans, that made me realize that I'm at fault for not standing up for myself more back then. And, right. And, and that's because of culturally we're taught not to create waves. And, mm -hmm. and I hope the next generations of, of Asian Americans, second, third generations would not be quiet about yeah. it. And we begin to see that happen on so many social media platforms that celebrate Asian Americans and, and people of color and, and calling out those injustice uh, uh, actions, like the Karens out there, right? That, and mm -hmm. that it, it really breaks my heart when I see those things because it, I had to learn what that meant all over again. And like you said, yeah. we, we, we don't think about it. Now, being Asian American and being a woman and working in a field that's predominantly male dominant with lots of machismo, what was that like for you? Um, I think, you know, entering this industry was always, you know, kind of, there were not very many females. I think I was um, in a lot of the kitchens I've worked at um i've always been the only um female on the savory side um there was always like a lot of girls on on pastry but in terms of savory there was always you know slim to none and so you know i kind of i i saw the culture and i kind of adapted to you know the culture in a sense where just you know being being tough and and just just having that tough, um, that tough exterior and just not letting things get to me. Um, and I was just, I, I just kind of built up this, you know, this tough exterior and, you know, just being tougher than the boys, I guess, um, was basically how I kind of got around, um, to being, you know, to working in these, these tough environments. Well, obviously your family had an Asian restaurant. You grew up yeah. in an Asian restaurant. So when you begin to venture out into the world of cuisines and, and, and building your own repertoire of the food that you want to make and working in a male dominated field and not a lot of Asian male dominated field actually, right? right. It's still, still not very diverse. What was that like? And what was the type of food that drawn you into loving the kitchen? Um, it's, you know, growing up in, in a restaurant, you know, we are, the family restaurant was more, you know, Chinese American. And so, you know, a lot of chop suey and, um, joy. you know, general, yeah, general sauce chicken, like things, things like that. Um, things that you can't find in Asia. No, things you can't <laughs> find in Asia at all. Um, so, you know, when I saw, you know, I watched a lot of PBS as a kid too. Um, I, I snuck it in when I could and, um, cause I wasn't allowed to watch television. Um, so when I watched TV, I, you know, I, I watched a lot of, um, Jacques Pepin and mm -hmm. Julia Child, and I saw a lot of the food that they were making. And I was really intrigued, um, because it is not what I was used to, but kind of just seeing these fancy plates of food or things that were just so foreign to me, I was just so drawn to it and it made me more curious. And I always loved food as a kid. Um, you know, and my, my parents call me super strange to, to this day because they don't know any kid that actually liked bitter melon as a child. Um, and that's, I mean, bitter melon, like that's, it, it is what it is. Like it's, it's bitter and it's a, you know, it's a bitter gourd. So, um, they, they always kind of knew that like, I, I would like anything that you'd put in front of me. Um. You had, so, yeah, you had a yeah. super palate. And <laughs> there are a class of, of percentage of a very small group of people have super palate, which has yeah. ability to taste food at a different level. Padma has that. Yeah. She actually yeah. got tested and she has that. And it's funny <laughs> you mentioned uh, bitter melon because that's one dish that she says she hates so much. And really? Eat. Yeah. On her show, she was with her mom in a market. She lived with her mom. <laughs> Well, not buying those, and her mom's like, "It's good for you. We need it's to buy." It's so it. good for you. But, I feel like when you eat it, you instantly feel better, like and, instant cooling, <laughs> like your body. <laughs> your body's going. There's so many great things out there. Appreciate life. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and I could tell her that she probably hasn't had the Taiwanese or Chinese version that's yeah. stuffed with pork and with black yeah. beans and eggs. I grew up eating that as a home cooking. You can smell Same. it when it's being made. Mm -hmm. And and I remember it definitely acquired taste when you're young and every Friday that's going to be on your plate. You learn to love it. <laughs> and then later on, you know, there's a period of time that you have that broken relationship with it. And then you're mm -hmm. like, oh, I kind of want to go back to that relationship. But now you crave for it. Even when you go yeah. to dim sum, they'll serve it as a side. Oh, I love it. Oh, I, I love, love it. it. So I think when you see Patma next time, you're going to have to make <laughs> it for her. Because she I says, think I'm going to have to, yeah. She says she will try it. She goes, oh, I can see that black bean will cover the bitter taste. Maybe, maybe I'll try it that way. The trick is to blanch it a little bit, to, mm -hmm. to take some of that bitterness out. It's going to be better no matter what, but it's going to take a lot of that astringency out. We have so many strange foods in Asia that that mm -hmm. the Western culture doesn't adapt very easily. For example, stinky tofu, right? Yeah. It, it, I don't know if you love it, but it is. I don't wonderful. love it. <laughs> That's uh, one of the things that I can't stomach. That and durian, I cannot do. Oh, I can't I, do it. I don't like durian. I like durian yeah. cake. That's okay. When I make into cake, the sweetness that wraps around it, because mm -hmm. I was, I'm in Singapore a lot. I work out of Singapore. Yeah. And Dorian is very popular in Singapore. But, but a stinky tofu, I, I love it. <laughs> I, have to say, I absolutely love it. And, and it's, it's definitely a quiet taste. And I understand for those people who have never had it out there. Yeah. Um, it's very popular in Taiwanese restaurants for sure. It is the yeah. quintessential street food and stinkier <laughs> the better if you're ever in asia and at a night market you smell that before you smell anything else <laughs> and you think somebody forgot to flush a toilet <laughs> that's a little intense that's for it, sure it's intense <laughs> but, it's a, but, but i love the fact that there's so many diverse things that that happens in our food culture so with with having working in an asian american type of restaurant when did you start refining your point of view and culinary point of view um honestly I don't think I don't think I discovered what I really wanted to cook uh until coming off of Top Chef mm -hmm. um but before I Top Chef you were working in the kitchen different kitchens already yes um so before entering Top Chef I was working uh with Michael Voltaggio at Inc um here in Los Angeles um he's also a Top Chef winner um six seasons before mine. Um, and yeah, like, I think working for him, I, you know, I instilled a lot of, um, a lot of great working habits, but also, um, you know, he taught a lot, he taught me a lot of different techniques, um, in, in the kitchen that I still use today. And so, you know, working for him was, was actually amazing. Um, cause I learned so much um, especially the ins and outs of the kitchen, of being in the kitchen. Um, so were you classically things, trained before you started working for, for restaurants? Did you go back to culinary school after the- I actually, yeah, I did. I did. I um, actually dropped out of college to, to go to culinary school, uh, which my parents were, weren't too happy about. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting story on its own, but um, <laughs> it's, it's actually pretty funny because I didn't know if this was something I wanted to pursue, um, but I decided to go to culinary school and kind of test out the waters. And um, so what were you studying before that? Um, nursing. Biology. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were the same so, person. <laughs> yeah. I, I did not like it at all. Um, and I think the pivotal, the pivotal moment where I realized like I would have to see, I would have to draw blood, things like that. I just, I just, I couldn't do it. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm done. Like, I can't, this is not for me. Um, and so, yeah, I, I enrolled in culinary school that literally like the next week. And yeah, that's, that's how my journey began. But how was the family? Well, how was your family uh, at the well, time? Well, they didn't really find out until really I was, um, as I was finishing up culinary school. Um, so I was still living at home at the time and I had accidentally left my knife roll, um, in the kitchen. And when I had got home, my mom was, my mom had opened up my knife roll and she was like, what's this? She's like, is and this I'm nursing like, tool for <laughs> nursing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were, like, there's some pretty gnarly knives in there. So you're like, I'm studying to be a surgeon now, mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with a, with a huge scimitar. Yeah. So she was just like. Uh, what, what are, what, what is this? And I'm like, oh, 
they're not mine. I'm just holding them for a friend. And she was just like, okay, Mm. kind of like Mm. very skeptical. I think she knew at the end of the day and, you know, they weren't all for it. But I think once, once they saw the kind of food that I cooked, um, once I finished Top Chef, I think they, they fully understood um, but when you say we're not for it, there are different layers of that question, right? For the Asian yeah. parents, um, not because they didn't want to support what you want to do, but they really right. truly want you to have a better life than right. theirs. And absolutely, in that particular path, if you're listen, if you're you are mom and dad doctors, and you say I want to be a doctor, they're going to support yeah. it, right? Because, and, for sure, and, absolutely. And and that's that's something that for Asian culture, we always have the same story. We have to do or we want to do what our parents want us to do so they can feel proud. But a lot of times it's not just, it's it's for us to have a better life than they had to go through, especially first generation, right? right? And yeah. my dad was a successful, successful photographer, many studios in, in Taiwan. And and I was too young to really understand the value of his skill set until I got older, you know? And, and I was that kid. I never want to be a photographer. I didn't want to snot any more chemicals. I don't want to be in a dark room. You know, this is before shooting digital. And then we come to the United States. Now all of a sudden I'm learning how to butcher a chicken. I'm like, this is what, when am I going to be able to be me, right? Mm -hmm. 20 years later, I'm doing all that all over again on my own. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) It's kind of the journey. So, so once your parents found out and you already at the, the, the place of, of working all these restaurants, what made you have this idea that you want to torture yourself to go on Top Chef? Um, (laughs) well, I never wanted to do TV. Um, and it actually started with, um, Michael signing me up for the show called Knife Fight. And, um, that's actually from another Top Chef alum named Alan Hall. Mm. And, um, so it was his show and it was, it's just a really fun show. Mm. You know, it was just kind of like the, the prize is bragging rights. And it was just amongst, um, it was like a competition among chefs in, um, in LA at the time. Um, and it was just a lot of fun, but it was just something that I was never prepared for. Um, basically, you know, Michael had called me up literally the day before the shoot and he's like, Hey, so you're doing knife fight tomorrow. And I'm like, what? I'm like, no, I've never even, I'm like, what, what is that? I'm like, I've maybe seen the show once or heard of it. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. And he was like, well, you better start watching and, and get yourself prepared because you're doing it tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, great. So he signed me up to do the show. And, you know, I went on, I did it. I didn't do horrible, um, <laughs> but I didn't do my best either. Um, it was just kind of like just getting thrown in the ring and, you know, fend for yourself kind of thing. And um, I, I prevailed which was a good thing. But um, yeah, I, I think after that experience, I was like, I don't know if I want to do any more TV. You know, that's that's just so intense. And so um, actually how Top Chef started is once you're kind of in that that roster of, you know, you've already been on a show, your name gets thrown around to a bunch of different casting agencies. And so um, they had already known about me and... Um, my friend had actually, she, um, she did PR and she did PR for the hotel that the casting was being shot at. And so she actually threw my hat in the ring and I was just like, okay, I don't want to do this. I like really don't want to do this. <laughs> and you watched the like, show art. At that I had, time, yeah, of course. Know uh, the Top show. Chef was probably like the best uh, food competition on, on TV by but far. you didn't want to be part of it. No, I just didn't want to make, it's not that I didn't want to be a part of it. It's, it's more, it's more or less just not making a fool out of myself on national television. You know, of course, like everybody's biggest fear is I don't want to be the first one to go home because, you know, who knows what's that, who knows what that's um, going to do for your career. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I think that was basically like the reason why I didn't want to do it. Um but, you know, I think, but also like the casting process was, it's, it's a really, really long process and tedious. And so if you, I feel like if you can complete that whole process, you're kind of geared up and ready to do the show. 
Oh, so good that you is, share that because a lot of people don't yeah. realize that all these reality television shows that that you see on TV, there's a producer casting and then there's casting director casting. There's so many yeah. layers that goes with it, and and cooking is probably the last thing that they 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 get to you. There's personality tests. I know that on my show for years for for Top Model show they have psychiatry you know evaluation. Oh yeah. Oh, right. for sure. Us too. Yeah. Us too. Oh, if I if you don't pass that, you're not getting on the show. I mean, you're holding sure. nice. I mean, we're not. We're holding like you know brushes and makeup and blow dryers, but but the, <laughs> the intensity for the for the contestants, you guys are um, sequesters for all intents yeah. and purposes. You are yep. locked up in a hotel. You get phone taken away, and you are oh, really yeah. there for from beginning to end. I think it's about three to four weeks, right, for you guys. Um, five five to six. Wow, longer than I yeah. thought. Six weeks. Yeah. And you well, don't get uh, including yet. including finale, um, mm -hmm. you're gone for you know for a little bit longer. So. So Michael really believed in you. He really thought that this is something that you need to go through because he went through it. Yeah, he definitely supported my decision to go on. I was actually a little scared to tell him at the time. Um, but you had to ask for time off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the um, the best thing about you know, working for him was, is he fully understood what the process was and, you know, he, he got it. And he's like, you know, every, every week he was like, are you, are you, are you in? Like, did you get it? Like, I'm like 90%. They said I'm 90%. Okay. And next week it's like 95%. And so you don't really find out until you get on until literally two weeks before you're actually mm -hmm. leaving to go to the, you know, the destination that you're going to be at. Um, so you. that's at uh, Boston for me, but that's, that in itself is a little scary because I mean, luckily for me, I, um, was getting out of my lease in my apartment. So I just gave up my apartment and kind of just moved my stuff into a uh, storage unit. Um, but yeah, like I, I just couldn't imagine being away for six weeks and not knowing how to pay rent. Cause mm -hmm. of course at the time, like, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, didn't know what I was going to do. Um, you know, for the next month until my next paycheck and, you know, things like that. So I'm really glad that it, it really worked out in terms, you know, of timing. Well, it worked out really well. You won. Yeah, it was, it's, it's definitely great. <laughs> Do you love television now competitions? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely fun to watch and, um, you know, especially watching this past season with a lot of my friends on the show, um, you know, Brian actually as my past mentor as well. And so I think it's, it's really, it's a really fun to watch like all the different, um, all the different personalities and in, in the dynamic in the kitchen. Like that's always, it's always great to see friends on the show. And is it, and I, I said this early on the other, sh um, the other shows that what's so fascinating to me is that you guys all know each other. You work in the same kitchen often yeah. and then you got to, you know, get to that table and do your best and competing against your friends. And, yeah. and it's such a different type of show than any other competition shows out there, because in a way that you want to support each other at the same time, you want to win. And, and Brian's been, I, I, I watched the final episode with Brian's like, I'm never coming back. I'm done yeah. the third time. And he's a bridesmaid, never the bride. You know? yeah. so, <laughs> and, and I was champion for him. And but at the same time, I really wanted Melissa to win. I really wanted yeah. the LGBTQ community to represent it and Asian American to be represented. And then, funny enough, I didn't realize so many Asian American women won Top Chef. Yeah. You know, yes. that's really a powerful <laughs> statement. That's yeah. such a powerful statement. And I, in my conversation with Pamela, we were talking about how important this show was because you really celebrated inclusion without making it obvious. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, look, we have a gay chef on the show. We have, we have a lesbian on the show. It wasn't about those relationships, like, like the type of show I've been on personally is all behind the scene drama, but truly about the food and celebrating the diversity of the, the food. So you said earlier that Top Chef gave you a culinary point of view. Is it because that it required you to focus so much on every quick fires and every dish that you have to make for elimination challenge? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just thinking about that challenge and um, thinking of what you want to cook. Um, Cause for me, like I, I know the kind of food that I, I always knew the kind of food that I like to eat. And so I always tend to cook that kind of food. Mm -hmm. um, Granted, I didn't cook that food in the restaurant I was working at at the time, but, um, you know, I, I cooked a lot at home, um, whether it was fancy or not, just, you know, I ate a lot of ramen 
as a line cook just because you know we're all poor um and it's and it's great and there's so many different you know applications that you can use um you know using ingredients like that and didn't so, you make a ramen from the dorm oh yeah that was that was <laughs> terrible <laughs> that was so oh, bad wait a minute speaking of ramen you made i a- totally forgot about that challenge by the way <laughs> It was a great chance for you guys out there. You haven't seen the season that uh, <laughs> May had to make a dish that is gathered from the dorm of the college, and, and yeah. uh, Andy Cohen was actually there as the the guest. And it was it was a fun episode, and I loved it because I I think nine out of ten evening I make ramen, and you know we have mm-hmm. the, the, the the mom way that you never drink the soup from the ramen. You have to wash oh, the yeah. ramen, and you you cook in a separate pot all the fans yes oh my oh my god yeah same that's so, so funny we that's should tell so these funny. guys what we're talking about tell yeah. them how you're supposed to cook ramen just for fun because when you so, buy those packages you should not just take it out and make it yeah so how my grandma uh cooked us ramen is she would take she would have a separate pot uh with water for the seasoning packet and and then a separate pot boiling for the actual noodles so you never cook the noodles all the way you all you always cook it like super al dente and um obviously to to add nutrition to the ramen it was always some type of choy some type of vegetable to it um yeah that's i mean that was like the healthy element to to our ramen um and then a lot of luncheon meat actually um was added into our ramen whether it was spam or you know just like some ham pieces or chasu that we had left over from the night before just different things like incorporated into the ramen and like that's that that was like a lot of my meal like growing up and um yeah like that's that's super nostalgic to me and and it, it's actually a lot of how i eat today as well well don't forget you want to totally glorify the ramen is Drop an egg in there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. And, you know what? A poached egg for sure. And I always tell my mom, like, you know, I was learning how to do poached egg for one of the episodes of a TV show I was on, and I go, my God, I never done that at home. You just like wait for the ramen's almost out and take, drop the egg in, and when the ramen's done, the egg is then the egg is perfectly mm-hmm. poached, and then you wash. So we call that washing the ramen, and yeah, because you, you don't want to eat the all that um, preservative that in the fry ramen so you have to do exactly carb washing yeah and that's that's a very asian thing right that's well <laughs> so, i love that i love that you, that we <laughs> share that but, but then you had to make it from the recipe from mm-hmm. dorm food or whatever is in their little fridge yeah and i remember you named it what did you name it <laughs> i honestly i have i don't remember i just remember i vaguely remember there was v8 juice mm-hmm. um and it wasn't a lot of soup yeah it was you were like yeah <laughs> you're like, it was not great it was not like, great i was definitely was not dealt a good hand for sure <laughs> you were like um mine was not the worst that day though i i do remember there was there was a dougie made a really bad one she he had like coconut water and like some type of cheese and it was <laughs> yeah i don't i don't remember exactly but it wasn't yeah it was well yeah. that was one of the light moments on the show there's a lot of intense competition throughout that so with that we were talking about through that process you found your culinary voice mm-hmm. so obviously it wasn't the ramen episode <laughs> 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 so what was the voice that you found um really it's just realizing the type of food that i want to cook mm-hmm. Um, so how would you flavors, describe that? What kind of food well, is that? Flavors that I grew up eating, um, a lot of nostalgic based foods, um, flavors like that. Um, let's see, examples being, um, you know, I love like being in LA and living in LA for so long, I've really adapted, um, Korean culture, um, I love Korean flavors and I was obsessed with it for a really, really long time. So making different types of kimchi and, um, you know, experimenting with different marinades. Um, I loved doing, you know, making that kind of food and I still do to this day. Um, you know, actually one of my friends jokes around with me. He's like, you're not even Korean. And I'm like, it's okay. I'm like, 
<laughs> I love it. So I can make it, right? And so I, I'm gonna have you take a picture of your refrigerator and I'll take a picture of mine. I think it's gonna look the same. There's a whole shelf of different kimchi and pickles and oh yeah. Uh, I think my power is the same. <laughs> my whole top shelf of my refrigerator is all condiments. Uh, actually my whole door is full of condiments and my whole top shelf is full with um pickles. different yuzu kyoshos and um kimchi, uh pickles. Yeah, different well, I'm things cleaning like out that. my outdoor garage this week just so, so I can get a refrigerator so I can put my kimchi out there because oh, they're, that's, they're, that's really smart. they're dominating over the house. Yeah. Because yeah. I can't just buy one, right? I'm like, I need to try this brand, this brand. And, I know. And a real close friend of mine, she has a, um, a website, a blog called Kimchi Avocado. She's California Korean. Mm -hmm. So every time the, her mom makes kimchi or she makes pickles, they always make it for me and I just keep piling up. And I live by myself, so I can't eat them all, all the time. Yeah. And she's always like, by this day, it's the best. This is the window period you have to eat. I'm like, I can't eat all that kimchi but by myself. I actually like, I actually love when they um, get super old and fizzy. Um, mm. And that's like the best kimchi for kimchi jjigae. So oh. I, I mean, it's okay that they get old. There's a, you know, there's a purpose for them. So. And, and for those of you guys out there, I know a lot of people might go, oh my God, kimchi is smell. Can I tell you that's the best food for your stomach? That is yeah. actually probiotics. eating your stomach. Instead of those $20 little tiny bottles of probiotic, just go mm -hmm. get yourself some kimchi and make yourself a kimchi taco because it's kind of yeah. amazing. <laughs> or just taking a shot of, um, just dilute a little bit of um, apple cider vinegar. Um, mm. Just taking a shot of that in the morning is is does wonders for your body. That's your tip for the day, guys. Yeah. So leaving Top Chef, you've graduated from that school. Um, you keep in contact with the contestants, and uh, how yeah. do you guys continue to support each other after that? Um, yeah, I mean, I talk to a lot of uh, the different contestants, even from different seasons. Um, you know, all the time. Um, I think social media is obviously a, a great platform to to keep connected with a lot of different people. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's great. I think, you know, a lot of people are supportive of, you know, what's, especially with what's going on right now. Um, everybody's just always checking in like, Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Any way I can help? Um, that's, I mean, it's, it, it's really touching because we're basically like this whole, the whole hospitality industry is very, um, you know, great at being hospitable and everybody's keeping connected and, and just being supportive. Um, just Has it always been that way? Because food industry, no different than the fashion industry I am, that um, they're, everybody's very competitive. People strive to be the best restaurant, get the best rating or best awards or whatnot. Was it always supportive or did it change during this time? Um, I think it got better during this time. Um, but I think we're always supportive of one another. Um, you know, if, you know, we're, we're downtown in the arts district. And I think that, you know, if one of our neighboring restaurants like needed some sugar, we would, you know, mm. happily oblige. And I think vice versa as well. Um, you know, I think what really gears, what, what really makes, yeah, we're all very competitive. But I guess we're going to do it in a great way in terms of like helping other people out. Um, it's not like, hey, you don't have sugar today. Like, I'm not going to help you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you got to lend a helping hand and, you know, it's you'll you'll get the same in return. I love it. I love that because yeah. we we know in history and and all, all the industry that's very competitive in a creative world that have really had to change it and evolved in the last few years. You know, the restaurant world have known to be very aggressive and leadership that's always not been so pleasant. And 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 same with my industry. We all being checked and rechecked of how we we behave and how do we lead our team as a leader in our team. And after winning Top Chef. And, and still being a female and still Asian American, do you feel like that you earn all the stripes that you no longer ever have to question your existence in the kitchen? Come again. <laughs> <laughs> well, after after winning Top Chef, having that mm -hmm. title, it, it means so much in, in this industry. And, but, but 
regardless, you went in as an Asian American woman and your ex is an Asian American woman, but you're working in an industry that's very male dominated. Do you feel like winning that title and, and finding your culinary point of view that, that you no longer have to ever question whether Asian American women belong in a leadership position in a kitchen? Um, I don't think I really ever um, questioned that, um, no matter what. I, I always knew that I was, um, bas- I, I was I was always a leader in a kitchen, uh, very dominant. And so I, I never really had any issues in, in terms of like proving my worth um, to others. Um, I definitely think that Top Chef helped for sure um, and kind of, put me out there in the world. Um, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, Did you yeah. see perception change for you? If you oh, always had absolutely. that confidence, right? So yes. the perception of who you are has evolved and changed. Yes. For the better, absolutely. for yes. the better. <laughs> well, what's next? What is next? Well, um, I think once once this is over, I'm gonna work on opening. Uh, I'm gonna work on opening something else. Um, so, yeah, just working on different projects and you know, kind of keeping myself busy in the meantime. Right now, um, I actually, way, thank you for the sauces. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, you for sending me those sauces. They're amazing. Yeah, no problem. Let's talk about those really quickly. So you create a line of, of small batch sauces. Yes. Um, so I created, so I actually, this started out as a project um, and something that I would send out to um, different colleagues and, and friends um, on the, in, over, over the holidays. Um, and so I just created, so it just started with just exo sauce. And exo sauce is a seafood condiment that's um, widely known in Hong Kong. Uh, widely known in Hong Kong. Um, it's, it's made with typically, um, dried scallops, dried shrimp, um, genoa ham, um, some rice wine, um, different seasonings. And yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different derivatives out there now. And, um, you know, I kind of started this as a, as a simple project in 2014, 2013, actually. And I, in over this last um, two years, I kind of started going full force with it. Um, very small batch. Um, I probably make about um, six cases of, of each, and that's oh, that's six. Yeah, six really? cases is like extremely, extremely small batch. Six cases, like twelve bottles in or twelve jars in a case, and so it's super small batch. Very, um, very focused, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's just something that um, I kind of wanted the the world to to see and enjoy and kind of get to know because that's something that I grew up eating. And so I, I love it. So I know that, you know, a lot of people are very um, excited about trying different new or different things. And so putting that out there in the world. And when can people get this? Um, For now, it's just via Instagram, Um, working on a website and it is sold. Um, downtown in Chinatown at a uh, at my friend's bookstore called Now Serving and so they they sell that there as well they sell all the sauces so I have an exo sauce which is um, made with dried seafood and then I have a vegan version which is actually made with um, some a lot of great mushrooms I'm giving and... that as a re-giving to my mom because my whole entire oh. family is vegetarian so oh fantastic it. yeah so that so the vegan exo is completely vegan and I have a chili oil as well um, that is also vegan. And so. that has been on my ramen noodles for the last two weeks. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I love it. You can't go wrong with a great chili. I um, know. It's, ramen. I'm like a, I'm a super condiment, mm. like crazy person. Like I go crazy for condiments, everything. I have a bunch of different hot sauces in my fridge. So yeah, I... You could say that I collect and a lot of friends, like when they go on vacation, they'll always bring me back like a jar of like different type of uh, chili oil or now I know. Or whatever. 
Now, yeah. when we're able to travel again, now I know what to bring you back. Yeah, I know. I'm, I miss traveling so much. When I was in Bali last year, that I, I was so overwhelmed at how many spices and condiments there. I bought every book they had about Bali, uh, about Polynesian food, Indonesian food, and it's still sitting there because it's so intimidating for me to just oh, open really? it. Because the recipe is like, oh. Oh, yeah. No. It's a lot of different spices. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to have to send you a list of the books I got because these were supposed to be from the chef there recommended. Like, these are the only ones you need. I'm like, great. And I didn't even look at it. I got on the plane. I'm a casual reading and doing, oh, I'm going to go and get all these spices and make it for Instagram content. I'm like, holy crap. It's like, it's like, it's crazy amount of recipes. It's not, it, it, and I find it very daunting. So I'll get there one day. I'll get there yeah. to, to play with all those ingredients one day. Yeah. It will be fun once I break the fear. Once I get started, I think it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, now's the time. Now's the time to be, you know, getting into those types of, uh, different, the, the intimidating uh, recipes rather. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being online, also sharing all your recipes online. And, and and that's one thing that I absolutely love so much during this time that has forced all of us to be a little bit more open and share. Because it's, it's sometimes I think a lot of people hold on to their recipes and they don't want other people to see. But now we truly are celebrating food in the best way. And food is yeah. really is the number one thing that heals all of us, especially for this sure. Time. It's and the best way you. to get everybody together. Thank you for being here with me today. And I absolutely cannot wait to meet you in person and yeah. taste your food. It would be an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me on. Absolutely. And we'll do it again and again. And next time, maybe we'll do something with your sauce. Fantastic. That was <laughs> Looking forward bye. to it. All right. Bye. Thank you. Hi, guys. So if you're not hungry yet, you haven't been paying attention because I am hungry. I'm going to go make ramen. Thank you, Melan, for being with me here today. Um, watching you on TV was inspiring. Listening to your stories, even more inspiring. And thank you for being Asian American, breaking glass ceilings and being incredible at what you do and follow your passion because that we can learn a lot from. Until next week, you guys, thank you for being here with me again this week. Next week, the guest will be announced on Sunday. I will be here from Tuesday to Friday and I will again, welcome you to join me on Let's Talk. Thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful, great weekend and stay safe out there. Bye-bye.